Hey boys and girls, Ken Smith, Ken Smith Fishing, welcome back. So this is our continuation of our great boat search for 2020, 2021. So uh, I'm not going to take you through all the criteria for the boat search because that's a lot of video. If you, if you didn't see the first video, so this is the second boat I've reviewed. The first boat we reviewed was the Bass Cat Puma uh, hybrid boat, which is a Bass Cat cap. It's a 20 foot, four inch long boat. With, the, uh, with a champion style hull under it. So it has a, a hull styled after the 203 champion underneath it. That video, there's two parts to that video. The first part of that, I take you through the entire criteria for how I'm gonna score these boats. And I, you'll see at the end of this video, actually at the end of the second video, this one's gonna be a two-part or two. Look, I know these videos are long, but I'm boat shopping. And you guys who are watching this are either interested in a new boat or a used boat. I'm not going to shortchange you. I'm going through every box, every dimension. I'm going through the whole thing, and I want you guys to see that. So that's why these videos are long. I'm trying to be real thorough with them. And, you know, some guys have asked me why in the first video I didn't talk about the price of that boat. Now, the price on that boat, and don't hold me or the guys Ross Motorsports to this, but I believe the price on that boat was $74.5. I am breaking down these boats. I don't care about the price, right? I mean, you could put another $15,000 worth of electronics on that boat. You can strip electronics off. You can put poles on them. You can take poles off. According to your, I mean, you could spend $3,000 on a trolling motor right now. So I'm not going to get bound up in the pricing except this. I consider some boats, apparently this is fascinating, as premium pricing, okay? Think Bass Cat, think Ranger think Phoenix. And then I think there are some boats who are what I'm going to call value pricing. And the one that immediately jumps to mind is a Nitro, right? You can buy, uh, well, I don't know that you can, but the advertised price on a 20-foot Nitro pretty well loaded out is in the low to mid-50s. That's a significant difference in the pricing. So as I go through this, some of the stuff that may not be on a value-priced boat is going to score well. Just because it's a value-priced boat, does not mean it's not going to score well. If, if I think it's a good value for what you're paying for it, I'm going to talk about that. But I'm not going to get hung up on whether the boat costs $71,000 or $81,000, although that sounds silly. It's just there's too many variables and how good a negotiator you are and how, what kind of deal your, your uh, dealer's trying to make to you. So this is more about the boat itself and the relative price compared to competitors kind of in that same boat class, if you will. So there you go. Again, if you want to see the full criteria, watch the first video in the Puma series. If your device allows it, you just saw an eye pop up at the top of your screen, and that's going to show you all that criteria. I spent about 10 minutes going through it to start that video. So today's video is the Charger 210 Elite. It is a great big boat. I got to tell you, I really like the, the performance out of this boat, but I'm going to ding the boat up about quite a bit of things that bother me about the boat and not as much about, well, you'll, get, you'll see what I'm talking about. So uh, let's dive right in. This is, by the way, thank you in this case. And, and so one of the things I really don't want to do is drive a bunch of brand new boats. And I've had several guys reach out and I appreciate that. And by the way, I'm looking at a bunch of boats. I really want to drive boats that are at least six months old. And I want to drive boats that are six months old because that's when you start seeing problems, right? A boat's been beat up a little bit. And, and I just, I want to see boats that are fully loaded. Now with the hybrid, I had to drive a brand new boat, but there's not going to be many more boats I look at that are brand new. I want to look at, unless there's new models out from, from manufacturers, you're going to see me looking at boats that got a few hours on them because I think that's a better judgment you know, once the, the new the new car smells worn off of them a little bit. So this is uh, Clinton Stacy of Outlaw Outdoors Charger 210 Elite. They were kind enough to let me borrow this boat. Thank you to both of them. If you don't know their circuit, it's a great uh, tournament circuit. Check it out. I'll put a link below to Outlaw Outdoors. But thanks to them. So let's jump right into the Charger 210 Elite, and uh, I think you're going to enjoy this. And again, I go through it kind of with a with a fine tooth tooth comb once again. Here we go. All right, good morning guys. Again, I'm finally in the water. It is 8:19. I've been up since 6 and I live 6 miles from the lake. Had a little trouble on the trailer this morning. 100% this guy's fault and of course not being familiar with the boat. Uh, take the transom saver off or you're not going to get them off the trailer. Crosswind got hung up. All my fault. Anyway, 
uh, we're ready to roll. We're going to check it out. So Charger Bob, by the way, for, for two people that really all they do is Carolina rig fish, there is not an inch of space in this boat that's not full. I thought I carried a lot of junk. So this boat is literally, I mean, the stuff in the boxes is formed to the lids. There's so much stuff in here. We're complete, our live wells are completely full and we are 100% full of gas. I think if this boat holds 52 or 54 gallons of fuel, I'll put it right there. So let's check the hole shot on this dude. By the way, it's confusing. It's got two keys down here, one of which is the power key and the other one is the cranking key. All right, motor's trimmed all the way down. By the way, I've already lost, I figured out yesterday or the day before when I did the Bass Cat Puma, I lost a GoPro 8 battery and a charger. So I'm not sure how I did that, but the videos are costing me a little bit already. Let's take the first spin. That is not what I asked that camera to do. First spin, here we go. She does not jump out of the hole, but it's turning to 25, so let's do it again. That was about 10 seconds in my head. One more time. Okay, so first rattle out of the box with Charger Bob. Uh, I'm impressed. It, it's got a surprising amount of lift, surprising amount of lift going down the lake. Now, I was downwind, I ran it in the high 60s, I'm gonna say 67, 68, again, completely full of fuel, completely live wells full. Coming back into the wind, I ran about 65. So what I'm gonna tell you is, if you wanna go fast boat, this is not your boat. But, 40 or 50% of the days on the lake as big as Rayburn, you're gonna outrun everybody, because you can run 50 or 55 and two or three foot chop, it's just, it's just that kind of ride, right? It's according to what you want. Uh, I know from being on the lake a lot that there's more days that it's rough than there are that it's smooth. And even on the smooth days, right? If you're about 220 in a Bass Champs tournament or an Outlaw tournament, uh, then you're gonna have a lot of rough water right off the bat. So we're doing our tilty test. Okay, so same test we did in the Bass Cat. Uh, the boat is uh, full of gas, full of water. We've got our level on the back deck. Both live wells are full. It's standing right here. Now, again, so interestingly, when I'm in the middle of the boat, it's still got a little bit of lean to the starboard side, which again is because of the way Clint's got the boat loaded. His gear's on the right side, his rods are on the left side. So it's got a 1.4 degree lean right now. If I go all the way to this side, it actually brings it back level. If I go all the way to this side, I'm at uh, 2.8 degree lean. So by the way, and 3% 3, 3 lean right there, three degree lean, excuse me. That's gotta have something to do with the performance on these boats. You cannot tell me that a load being that much heavier that the boat tilts at a couple of degrees. So if I'm standing dead in the middle, the boat it is uh, between a one, let's say a one two and a one nine degree tilt. You can't tell me that doesn't have an impact on the performance. So I'm going to say he might want to distribute his weight a little bit differently. And now let's do it from right here. I can't see it, but there's the degree lean with me standing on the, uh, on the starboard side, right next to the, po the pole on the back deck where I might be fishing, and then done the same thing on the port side, and we'll see what the numbers read out for us here in a minute. By the way, for you bass open guys, you see all this hydrilla? I'm actually in mud. So there's a lot of hydrilla in mud right now. Shallow, but there's hydrilla. Okay, at the pole across the back deck, we got fishable space of 77 inches. Now, a, a good 
A guy with any memory could tell you what it was in the other boats, but I can't. But we'll we'll note that below. And on the front deck, that's a pole. Let's call it 61 and a half inches right there. Okay, I just got to make a, a run in some pretty heavy seas. I, I'm gonna say two footers, but it was dead behind me, and the boat the boat performed beautifully. Uh, I will say of the three boats that I'm, four boats that I'm familiar with right now, and that's gonna be my Ranger, uh, a, a big Triton, and I can't remember the model number, I'll post it here, which is Steve's boat, uh, the Puma, and this boat. Now, in fairness, this foot boat's a foot longer than the Puma. The other three boats are all 21 footers. If you told me I had to go across Erie to Lake Sinclair today, this is the boat of those four I would want to be in. Purely from big boat, big boat feeling ride. Uh, I did notice a couple of other things about the boat uh, coming across there. Uh, number one, and I've always wanted these, and I know I know of somebody who can aftermarket install them in your boat. This boat has seat heaters. Now, probably not going to use them today because it's going to get to 100 today. But there's been many days I would have loved to have a seat heater to knock the frost off the seat, to warm the seat up, especially to knock the frost off the seat. I love that. What a great option. By the way, another option on this boat I read on the website is an infrared camera on the front. I don't know what you use that for other than Bigfoot hunting, but if I were to buy this boat, I'd have to have one. Uh, the other thing I like is they did give you, which by the way, this is an issue with some consoles. So if you're thinking about buying a boat, and putting a lot of graphs on the console, it's really handy to have a flat spot. You see they have an absolute flat spot there. Uh, if you go back to some of my older videos, actually I'll post one right above right there, where I was talking about different ways to mount graphs and different mounting systems on there. This one Clint has, by the way, is really solid. The, actually, it the, doesn't feel like it's screwed in there, but this part of it is super duper solid, and they've given you a nice flat spot. Now, a lot of guys are mounting their graphs here, um, I don't like it because it's hard to see over. I love it in the rain, but I would rather have them off to the side or in the dash. Uh, although you can get a better angle on them here than you can down there. Sometimes when they're in the dash, that lean as opposed to being really straight up and down, you get some glare on the sun. So that's all kind of personal preferences. But this is, you know, I don't know if they thought it out or not, but that's real nice to have a flat spot, a really solid flat spot to mount your graphs in there. And who doesn't love seat heaters? I also noticed that there are live well lights, which is cool as well. So uh, I like that as well. Um, I will say on fit and finish, there's things like, you see under there, it looks like maybe the material under the seat wasn't sewn up real well. Um, you know, I'm, I'm gonna score them poorly for the latch lids. Not poorly, I'm gonna score, that's gonna count a little bit against them. And they also use these boxes, and there's several of them. There's one there, and there's two down here. And they're these little plastic side boxes. And they just, I'm sorry, they just feel kind of cheapy. Uh, I believe Vexus is using that as well. Now, I'm not gonna, that, that, uh, in the Vexus that I got to lean into, they had one of those boxes as well. And interestingly, the, the Vexus Pro who was in that bo box, in that boat said don't open that box it's already broken so I don't like those they just feel cheapy and they're gonna rattle right so they got a good place here for your uh, for your tools and for your uh, uh, measure stick and I like by the way this is something Clint did in his setup he put a talon control right there and I like that a lot and I'll tell you why I catch a fish miss a fish sit down here and re-rig and when i'm ready to get back to go fishing i can go ahead and hit that so by the time i get to the trolling motor up in my case my power poles but in his case his talons are up they're out of the way and he's ready to roll so so that's a slick idea from a setup standpoint and i've got a remote for my uh, a wireless remote for my power poles you know obviously i have one at the dash and I have one at the at the bow, but that's a good idea. Once I saw what he put that there, I thought, why did he do that? 
and that makes really good sense so there's just a setup idea again that's one of the cool things about borrowing other guys boats by the way too is to see what they've de done in their setup to make their fishing more efficient now having said that I don't know that there's any efficiency available in there but man, he got a whole lot of stuff and by the way there's another fit and finish issue you see that light strip down there it's just dangling down so obviously it's come disconnected I had a light strip in my glove box on my Ranger that was never connected. And when I tried to stick it up there in place, it kept falling out. So just a little fit and finish issues. And I've already told you, I'm gonna, I'm gonna pick on my Ranger quite a bit in the fit and finish because it ain't the boat it used to be. But there's just a couple of little fit and finish things in here that I'm not excited about. But from a, if you want a bass boat and you think of a bass boat as a tool like a hammer or a screwdriver, this is a pretty dang fine hammer or screwdriver right here. Let's fish a little more. Okay, uh, several things. I've been out in the boat now for a couple hours fishing around in it. Uh, several things I like, a couple things I don't like. Um, so the decks are padded. I like the layout. It's a huge front deck. Now, it seems wide to me. We'll measure, you know, we've got the coordinates or the uh, measurements from earlier to compare it to my boat. Uh, but it seems really wide. I really like that seat. I never use a butt seat, but that's comfortable. I like the way Clint's got the, uh, the unit stacked. Something I talked about in that bass cap. I love being able to get to a trim switch. You know, Ranger puts them over there, which is where my graphs are. But they've done a smart thing, right? They're protected when the trolling motor's up, and they're not in the way when you won't go to step into the boat. It's got a good step into the boat. Uh, it, I just it's a nice clean layout of course recessed foot pedal everybody has that I don't like the little pools that one's good but those are kind of hard to get a hold of I'm sure the box is locked I'll figure that out in a little bit uh, it's got some lighting up on top but it looks like you got to go to the back to turn that on uh, it does have like we talked about in the other boat really smart it's got a cleat right there above the, all the buttons and the consoles for you to uh, tie up to the dock. Now, uh, same as the bass cap, though, I do not believe you could get maybe not even a 10 in the dash. You see Clint's got his mounted off to the side really well. Uh, I like this compartment. This is super stable, and it's also a pretty comfortable seat. I really like the seats in the boat. The boat's got really nice seats in it, very comfortable. Uh, what I don't like about the ice chest is it doesn't lock and it really doesn't seal up very well. So it's going to lose ice at a pretty high rate, I think. Uh, now, the middle box is not as deep as my box is. Uh, it's a smaller box, but you can store rods there. I really like the rod layout. I like how wide the front of that is to put your rods in there. And I'll tell you something else I really like. It's hard to see because they've got a lot of stuff in here. But the other box has the same rod box set up. Now, I fish by myself a lot. And by the way, I don't see that those box lids locked. I'll, I'll add in the comments below if they do. So one of the things I've said for quite some time is I fish by myself so much. From a weight distribution standpoint, I would rather have this box on the star on the port side be gear and the starboard side be the rod box that's not how my boat's set up it makes more sense because my gear weighs more than my rod so i like that a lot that i can choose which side and i would choose to put it on the starboard side which is unusual for most guys a couple other things i'll note back here i lost my lid uh, big live wells these are 40 gallon live wells so these are some of the biggest live wells we've seen let's check the depth on them Okay, so yeah, so now that live well is 19 inches, so you can see it's really full now. It's up over the spray nozzle. So uh, you can put a whole lot of water in those live wells. Uh, the other thing I did note back there in the back was um, the uh, there's it's a manual plug. So on a Ranger, there's a switch on the back of the boat, on the transom, that you can open and close the valve. So if you forget to put the plug in, uh, it's real easy just to close it. You don't have to get in the water. You don't have to pull the boat out. Okay, so right back where we left you uh, at the start of that video with Hollis still hanging out with me. Um, so 
I'm going to stick this footage in here. Now, if you if you follow my Rayburn reports or my Rayburn Toledo East Texas fishing reports, you've already seen this footage. But if not, by golly, I'm putting this footage in anyway. So we'll get to part two of this in a minute. And if you don't want to watch this, skip about the next two and a half minutes of this video uh, and go right to the next video. But while I was out fishing, by the way, this boat charger's actual name is Charger Bob. So they named their boats. This is Charger Bob. And while I was out in Charger Bob, you know what happened. I caught one of the biggest fish of my life. I've caught seven fish, double digits, and this is the sixth biggest one I ever caught. And it's great footage. And skip it if you don't want to watch it again, but I'm going to show it to you again. So here is my one fish. I only, well, actually, I caught two fish. I only fished about 45 minutes this day. Mostly this is just running around and, and feeling the boat out. But in that 45 minutes, I caught a nice one. Check it out. So there you go, 1031 in charge of Bob. Uh, I was real pleased with that fish. Obviously, I hollered like a little kid, right, Hollis? Heck yeah, Dad. Uh, anyway, so part two will be posted in the next 48 hours. Uh, I don't know if I'm going to get it up Wednesday or Thursday, but I'll get it up and we'll grade this boat out. We'll finish up uh, the rest of the boat that I've not shown you yet. We'll grade the boat out. And then our next boat is going to be my Z521C. So. It's only fair to grade the boat that I fish out of since I'm grading everybody else's boats. So stick around. Next video will be up here real quick. Thanks, guys.